Welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press, and let's say hello to our guest, Mr. Ie Tok, a public affairs analyst. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Morning. Always my pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Let's start with the Punch newspapers. Headline says, Petroleum Industry Act. States tackle federal government today as Federal Accounts Allocation Committee meets. NBA advises governors. We'll review the law at FAAC today and disclose our position. That's according to Benue Commissioner. NBA, Ozekome tells state government to challenge Petroleum Industry Act in court. Above that headline, it reads, World Bank, AFDB, others to fund 4.89 trillion Naira budget deficit. Call for self-defense, ACF, Middle Belt, Back Masari, Ohanese, flees government. Sokapu, false arms ban. And Sokapu says they will challenge Southern Governor's arms ban in court. IT investments dropped by $53 million in one year. PIA full implementation in 2022. Nigeria loses $50 billion investments. The long begs warring groups, gunmen kill five, four missing. FEC approves 658 million naira for sniper dogs. Education, others, 21 billion naira. Dr. Strike, NMA meets NAD Friday. Patients resort to self-care. Uh, we also see APC releases timetable for September 4 local government congresses. And all your youth protest WASSC candidates killing blame Amoteko. All right. Now moving on to the Daily Independent. Big story you can see there says, expect benefits of uh, Petroleum Industry Act from 2023, says the FIRS. Targets 10.104 trillion Naira revenue in 2022, says Twitter, Facebook coming into tax net. Uncertainty. Underinvestment in oil industry gone. And that's from President Buhari. OK, Steering Committee on Petroleum Industry Act says host communities will get real, lasting benefits. Police deploy 1,000 for Oluwari Saturday coronation. And a flood uh, hits 32 states, says Buhari chides governors for ignoring warning. APC fixes local government area congresses for September 4th. And COVID-19, Oshimbajo harps on need for innovation and action in vaccine manufacturing. We are working to regulate social media, says Minister. And also courts rejects AGF. DSS plea to dismiss Sunday Boho suit, says restraining order still subsists. Aud the Auditor General is in the news this morning saying 4.973 trillion Naira missing from Federation account. Also, FEC OK's 658 million Naira for deployment of dogs to Lagos Abuja airports. Okay, all right, those are the stories on the Daily Independent. Um, let's turn to the Nation newspaper. Buhari, $50 billion investment lost in 10 years without oil sector law. Silver's implementation panel on PIA gets 12 month mandate. Declare Boni led caretaker panel illegal, APC chief tells court. APC council congresses for September 4. Gunmen kill 17 in Zamfara, Plateau states, 50 abducted. Courts turns down government, government's request to dismiss Igboho's suit. Gunmen attack empty bullion van in Ondo. NNPC targets ventures in gas fired 5,000 megawatts. FEC approves 21.11 billion Naira for aviation education others contracts. Uh, and also, Unilag reopens. Those are the stories on the Nation newspaper. The Daily Trust comes up next. Doubts trail surrender of Boko Haram members. Repentant fighters could be deceptive, says a traditional ruler. We will not forgive them, IDPs and residents say, and also uh, we are sure they are insurgents, defense headquarters. Bandits kill seven Nigerian soldiers, three villagers, abduct 17 others in Katsina. NNPC partners sign 50 megawatts Maiduguri Power Project pa uh, Pact and fear grip Zamfara communities as, as new armed group emerges. Despite dropping inflation rate, prices of goods and foodstuff on the rise. Two years after, constituents lament as fate of a 14 Edo lawmaker's elect hangs. 
and Buari to attend son's wedding as activities begin in Bichi today. All right, those are the stories we can take on the Daily Trust. Uh, good morning, Mr. Nyaya Tok. Thanks for joining us once again. Good morning once again, and um, always a pleasure to be on Plus TV Africa. Good to see you. Um, I think we can start with the one on the um, Daily Independent from the Auditor General saying 4.973 trillion naira missing from the Federation account. You know, some of these things I find it difficult to know where to start from. Why would government always come up with all these figures to the public? Is it that they have no idea of what to do in the sense that if something is missing, my common sense tells me that the first thing you do is call the necessary investigating officers. When that's been done, we take the second step of trying to ascertain if this is a crime or if it is a mistake. If it is a mistake, we carry out institutional, correctional, um, you know, uh, dynamics. We activate it. If it's a crime, we call in the prosecuting agencies. And what we should be hearing is that these people have been jailed on account of these, then they can tell us the actions that they took. That, in my opinion, is what governance is all about. But when you come to the floor of the house or come to the nation and tell them that, oh, this amount of money is missing, I ask a simple question. To what end? Is it for you to get the sympathy of Nigerians? Is it for us to say, hey, yeah, so terrible? Is it for us? Why are they telling us this? Is it for us to be more careful? Is it for us to lose more interest in government? Is it for us to doubt them some more? What is the underlying intention or for the Auditor General to let us know that he's doing his work? Hmm. He's been able to unravel some things. Are we the people he should send such information to? So maybe you guys can help me because sometimes I actually find it a little difficult to understand how this will operate. Oh, I, I wish we knew because, you know, I'm also as uh, uh, confused as you are. You know, so it's pro probably the last one, the Auditor General trying to let Nigerians know that he's doing his work, he's doing his job. Um, but, you know, once again, of course, uh, as expected, not very much will be done, you know, after a headline like this. As expected, not very much will be done. Mm -hmm. That is, unfortunately, the sad reality that we face as Nigerians. And think about that statement. It's, it's, it's depressing. When you, you, now, if we are the system that we know that, wow, that this has been said next, before we can say Jack, we would get the second part of it. I can live with it. But when the conclusion is that, unfortunately, not much will be done, it's depressing. And when you realize this amount of money and what people are going through, anyway, let's go on. I think as some other matters arise, we'll be able to take on something. Yes. Okay. Um, we see the story of, of uh, Sunday Adem, also known as Sunday Boho here. Um, his lawyer actually filed a, a suit asking the Oyo State High Court in Badon to um, stop hearing the case instituted against him um, by the federal government. But the court in Oyo State rejected that request, saying that it would go ahead to hear the suit, um, to hear all the sides regarding this matter. Um, apparently, what's still happening um, regarding this case is that Malami has asked for um, time extension for them to be able to hear and further process all opposition to Igboho's application. And um, we know that Igboho was actually arrested in Kotonou in Benin Republic after being on the ground for 19 days. So what this means then is that the court case will still go on and we're yet to see the end of the legal battles between the federal government of Nigeria versus Sunday Igboho, isn't it? Yeah, in one sense it is. On the other hand, I'm asking myself a very, very simple question. What am I supposed to take on that as a Nigerian? 
Am I trying to see justice can be served? What am I trying? What am I trying to get out? My mindset is actually very different on this matter, as you would have realized by now. I'm just asking myself, where do I draw a line between stories, gists, and lives being dealt with on a daily basis? Let me come up with a conclusion that on account of these, there is a strategic move by government to ensure that the lives and properties of every Nigerian, that the freedom of every Nigerian, that the right of every Nigerian is guaranteed. If that is my take from it, then maybe uh, that's great. But if it's another story, another gist, uh, then really, honestly, at my age, I think I'm tired of those stories. Right. Okay. So I want us to talk something more nationalistic. It's the PIB. Um, finally, it was signed or assented by the president. But um, the reactions to this have been missed First of all, um, we have stories that state governors have been urged to go ahead and challenge that in court. Um, it says the national um, the NBA actually advises governors to do that, um, as well as Ozekome um, telling state governors to challenge this in court. First of all, state governors are, are supposed to meet on this today with the FAAC. So they're, they're saying that lots of stakeholders in this matter have been sidelined and that, you know, if they couldn't um, solve this matter, you know, before it was passed, that it can do so in court. Two things come straight at me. The first is we have people in government that really don't understand why they are there in the first instance. Processes of government is so clear cut. We have the three arms of government, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. The legislature has a process of law making. This process is sustained and fortunately for the governors, they literally control the legislatures. They sleep on duty. They keep quiet. The bill is put before the house. It goes through the first reading, it goes through the second reading, it's committed to the committee, it goes through public hearing, it comes back to line by line, before a final decision is made, for goodness sake. I can understand the common man that does not really have as much access to these people because like the PIB, we all know what the popular opinion was and that at the end of the day, the lawmakers did what they wanted to do. Now that's different from the governors because the lawmakers over 90% of them are literally in the pockets of the governors. So when your lawmaker was doing this, I want to know how many governors called their lawmakers and presented the position of the state. How many of the gov uh, governors called their, their lawmakers and had their own in-house public hearing so that the articulated position of the state is what is given to the lawmakers, and they go to the chambers because they, one of their core functions is that of representation. They say, my people, not me, nobody cares what your opinion is. My people say on this matter, they stand on this. If that is done, then the governors know that they've done their best. The PIB, I'm from the Niger Delta, like you well know. And I've been in New York for a very long time now. Yet I can't remember the government of Ibom State calling us together on this matter, taking a corporate decision, communicating it to our lawmakers and say, this is where we stand, okay? At the end of the day, this bill is passed. You want to start this new process or we want to go and challenge in court? It's a legal process, it's an allowed process, it, it, it's okay. But what it will achieve is what I don't know and I cannot speculate. So for me, I wish them well on that score. But if we're talking of the PIA, I think it's not PIA, you know, in Nigeria we have, we always say something is on the double, PIA, PIA, and if you add a guard to it, then it means something else. But let's look at the PIA on its surface. If we had to talk about that, don't know what the time is, then we will also look at one or two things concerning that because I have one or two strong opinions on that. Oh, you know, like one of our guests said yesterday, it seems like a lot of uh, uh, the people in the National Assembly are representing their political parties and not representing the people who put them there. Okay. So.
it's a valid, a valid yeah. observation. Yeah. And it's, it's a very wrong. When, when you talk of representation as one of the three core mandates of lawmakers, that representation is that of the people, which is the essence of democracy. Yeah. That's why a lot of money is voted to them to have constituency consultations. So you are coming here to, you are, they, are, they are mainly reporters of the minds of the people and not people who are there to do the biddings of their party. All as right. soon as you step into that, the so, chambers, red or green, you cease to be partisan. You uh, cease to talk. become, yes. Yeah, okay, well, um, I, I, because of time, let, let's quickly move on to Zamfara State. It says on the Daily Trust, uh, fear grips uh, Zamfara communities as new armed group emerges. Sanyata, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you very yeah, well. Go ahead. I, I, I wanted you to respond to that uh, story. You see, there is a cycle that we shouldn't, I'm not a security person, but certain things are just generic, so to speak. Once there is a group and there is an enterprise, it's just like in politics. Sooner or later, there's going to be new APC, new PDP, new this, new that, because people look at power and there's always this concept of monkey the walk, baboon the chop. So sooner or later, it started right from heaven, you know, Satan said, look, I'm this important. Why can't I also be the boss? That's just a statement. And you know how you rebelled against God. And it comes down. The Boko Haram or the insurgents or the, the terrorists and everything, they are never going to be monolithic for two reasons. One is reason of greed. The second is reason of strategy. So I think that we ought to look at how to infiltrate their ranks, just like they are coming back to infiltrate our ranks by way of the so-called repentance, you know? We need to be a few steps ahead. So we need to start to have people in government who understand tact and strategy, and not people who, through thinking, is just their belly and their pocket. And within that context, anything goes so long as they benefit at the end of the day. They are even willing to allow insurgency to thrive if by so thriving, they can use it as a means of security votes to get a lot more money. So all they think of is money. We need to bring out a new generation of Nigerians that think in terms of the people and service. And this is possible. And unless we understand this narrative that the people in power largely, with all due respect to the few exceptions that we have, are largely thinking of themselves, their pockets, their bailies. And we need to start to evolve and change that narrative. And the time to do this is now. I tell people, go and join a political party. They are a good person. There's something I said, let me end on this note. There's something I said to an Uber driver that brought me back um, yesterday from the airport. And I, I told the driver, I said, what do you think of politics? And the driver said, ah, no, no, Mio, I can't, I can't get involved in that. I said, okay, I like the idea that you buy a new car and you don't care who drives the car. Anybody can. He said, no. I said, that's what it is. Government drives you. Government drives your life. And you are so intelligent that you don't care who drives that car. You just, he said, wow, you know, I've never thought of it that way. Oh, God, not true. I've never, ever thought of it that way. This government, they can just do one policy today and there's no Uber again. They can do one policy and then you can, they can even say ladies cannot drive in Nigeria again. Oh, God, that's true. And I think, I hope Nigerians can wake up to this mindset that government is the driver that drives our lives. And we can no longer allow anybody to just get in there because we think that policy is dirty. Policy is not dirty. And um, when we do this, we start to think in terms of what governance is all about, service to the people, as different from a private business. A private business thinks of personal profit. Government thinks of general good. And whoever gets into the government must have the concept and the mindset of general good and not personal profit. Okay. Today, 90% of government is on personal good and doesn't work that way. All right, Mr. Nieto. Lastly, I still want us to talk about security. And it's taking a closer look on the headline on the Daily Trust that says, Doubts trail surrender 
of Boko Haram members. We spoke about this extensively yesterday um, on The Breakfast, but I want us to focus on a part here um, where Daily Trust interviewed um, internally displaced persons who were chased out of their homes because of the Boko Haram insurgency. So um, hearing from them, they said that um, it, it's, it's a shame that the government said they want to accept repentant Boko Haram terrorists and reintegrate them into society when them themselves have been in IDP camps for years, as much as seven years, they have not been reintegrated into society. So I don't know how you, you come in regarding this. Does it seem like, actually their own words is that the government has been unfair, seems to be pampering these terrorists while you know, they're still languishing there and suffering in IDP camps. My sister, if you want to hear the very honest truth from me, I really don't know what the policy of government towards the interests of government towards these terrorists, that they cannot be declared terrorists. Number two, they are using everything to try to, it's like either they are paying them lots of money or they are treating them like um, they are really endangered species that need to be protected. I've not seen a government that comes hard on the insurgents. And I, 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 I hate to think that this is an oversight. I think there's something deeper and more fundamental. Look at the people in the camps. These are people who were killed, chased out of their homes, displaced. And then tell me how you will feel when you hear that the man that killed your parents, the man that chased you out of your farm, the man that has made life miserable to you for the past seven years is being courted, is being brought to, to kind of reintegrate them into the society. While you are still abandoned, the victim is abandoned, the aggressor is being appealed at and being appeased. It just doesn't add up. Maybe there's something I'm not seeing. It just doesn't add up. Mr. And I'm our guest yesterday. Yeah, I want it's still same discussion, but I want you to you know respond to something that, that we heard yesterday. The guest uh, that we had spoken with, you know, said that some of these uh, people who are being reintegrated or being um, or surrendering or being forgiven by the government are people who are victims of you know failure of government, and so they were kidnapped and forced into terrorism, and so the government cannot necessarily just jail them or punish them, you know, or kill them because they you know were forced into terrorism. Um, ha, what's your response to that? Ha, 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 ha. What a brilliant explanation. They must have engaged a consultant to give them that amazing narrative. I, I think they must have done such thorough research to come to the point where they're able to sift this person from that person. They, how they arrived at that is mind-boggling. But let me say this, and I want us to think of it very seriously. There are two parts of this terrorism. One is ideology. Two is enterprise. One is ideology. Two is enterprise. Anything that is enterprising, even when we started shooting armed robbers, it did not stop armed robbery because of, and you cannot even compare armed robbery to kidnapping. Ham robbery is hard work, little benefit. Kidnapping is soft touch, so much benefit as the enterprise of these terrorists. The second is the ideology. And ideology is so, so, so difficult to extract. And I want to see the, 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 the plan of government through National Orientation Agency to reorientate the minds to give a counter narrative to this ideology. I'm not seeing, but they are coming to tell me, oh, these are the people that were forced. You were there, right? I beg, let's, let's uh, take care of the people that were displaced. Make them happy first. Make the people that go in there to be very, very unattractive. And God of mercy and grace will know how to sift the shift or the, the shaft from the wheat amongst them. Those who are innocent, God knows how to get across to them. But you as man, Take care of the one that you have direct control over, the IDPs. And don't go and try to convince them that these are the people that were victims and forced into it. Doesn't make sense. All right, Mr. Yeah, talk. we thank you very much for your thoughts on Off the Press this morning. Do have a great day.
Thank you, and same to you both. All right. Stay with us. Uh, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we're moving to uh, Today in History and sharing with you things that happened on this day many years ago. Uh, I'm going to go back to 2003, oh, really? I believe, or, or any of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back.